steps of my key. Help, I'm addicted, controlling the cravings that control you. We're going to do something a little bit different on this audio book. I am going to actually read the manuscript, but I'm also going to stop at certain spots and possibly pray for people or uh, interject maybe some new things that have come up. It's kind of a, the way I do the audio books is kind of like a, you know, a sermon. You've got a skeleton, but then you, know, you can add some extra things. Also recording a podcast right now so we can release the book as a podcast that you can watch and listen to, or if you have the audio version of the, of the book. So I'm going to get right into help. I'm addicted, and I've got uh, here on the podcast, you can see, you'll be able to follow along here in the manuscript. The book is actually available as a free download at our church website, westsidechristianfellowship.org, westsidechristianfellowship.org, free download of the book. And uh, you can find, of course, on Amazon and Kindle and other places, but a free download is at our church website. And there are um, links in the book. They'll take you to some of the sermons. There's extra information, too, that's in the book as far as the dedication, acknowledgments, the contents. You can see we're going to talk about a quick word to pastors, give a quick disclaimer, and then we've got some important chapters. Addiction, hope for the hurting, changing from the inside out, resisting temptation, the fully surrendered life, the cost of addiction. The Power of the Renewed Mind, Overcoming Regret, Pushing Through the Withdrawals, The Gift of Health, The Truth About Alcohol, and Depression and Mental Illness. We're going to talk about five things you need to know on that. But I want to start uh, this chapter, this podcast, with uh, a, a section of the book that I think is so important. It's a quick word to pastors. We have a form of microwave Christianity. Service times, our church service times, are cut down to just over an hour. Prayer is glanced over, and worship is designed to entertain the masses. People are bored, they say, so our services need to be more appealing. You can increase attendance with slick marketing and entertaining programs, but you may miss the heart of God. Did you catch that? You can increase attendance with you know, slick marketing and entertaining programs, but you will miss the heart of God. That is for certain. As Martin Lloyd-Jones said, his name is actually D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, are we giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity in our churches? Are we so tied to our programs that he is excluded? Why this formality? Now, these types of services will not help those in the throes of addiction or bondage. That's my point in adding this. Many times we've seen at our church to really press in to break down strongholds. Uh, you've got to have you know worship nights, a uh, time to press into the, to, to God and working in prayer rooms where people can be prayed for and, and see deliverance take place in, in many cases. To truly help people, we can have schedules for the flow of the services, but we shouldn't be clock watchers. Have worship, but allow God to move. Prepare a message, but be open if God desires to change it. Have a time of prayer, but don't be in a hurry. Uh, you know, why not go into the worship and prayer services and let people know that, hey, you can respond to the message? Breakthroughs cannot be rushed. We must spend time seeking God. Now, why are a large portion of Christians in the West desensitized to strongholds in their lives? Why is there a general lack of conviction? Carnality not only affects the pew, but the pulpit as well. A carnal pastor still offers motivating sermons, but he will lose the unction, the boldness, and the spiritual insight. The world and carnal Christians will love him, but spirit-filled believers will leave the service starving for more of God. Pastors, if we would make it our goal to know Christ more personally, we would preach Christ more powerfully. Are we calling people out of the deception and cultural mindset that they are enslaved to, or are we encouraging sin by our silence? So that's kind of the introduction to the book. Obviously, we have to have disclaimers, you know, saying that the book uh, and this audio is just based on personal experience um, and nor the, nor the author nor the publisher will be held uh, accountable uh, or liable uh, to any persons or entity with respect to damage caused indirectly or directly from the information provided in this audio version of the book. Uh, and again, I go on to say, talk about website links that are in the book. So if you actually have the book download, I hope you can do it from the, the free download. I haven't checked, but we should have links in there you can click. If not, I know it's on Kindle uh, when you open on Kindle and other sources. So 
Opening the chapter one, you knew this would happen. How many times were you told, but you challenged my power. You chose to be bold. You could have said no and then walked away. If you could live that day over, now what would you say? Powerful poem that I pulled this from, and I'll read the entire poem here in the future. But let's look at uh, chapter one, addiction. Is there any hope for the hurting? Uh, As most of us know, we are at a crossroads. Opiate and alcohol abuse are leaving a path of destruction in their wake. Pornography is desecrating families. Obesity is skyrocketing, uh, plaguing millions and reaching epidemic levels even in children. So this whole book is about addiction in general. Heart disease and cancer are by far the leading killers in America. And on and on it goes, from nicotine to caffeine to food. As a society, we are out of control. But are there answers? Yes, there are. If we once again, here's the key, if we once again, I don't know if I can highlight this for you, I don't think so. If we once again, I can, if we once again set our sights on God's truth. Again, I'm also recording a video podcast of this book that you can watch. Now, how can one book address opiates, alcohol, pornography, caffeine, gluttony, and all other forms of addiction? I mean, wouldn't each of these need a volume or a book of their own? And yes, it's true. I mean, while each addiction can be elaborated on, at the heart of addiction rests a common denominator known as a strong hold. For example, if I give in to the addiction of caffeine and I have to have my coffee every morning, I've given that addiction control. And so I'm going to be weaker in other areas when I say no to you name it, you know, uh, if I want to try to have a, a you know, a beer, an alcohol but I've already given into another addiction, so my strength is gone. And you know that lust and different things are fed. It, it's, a, it's a common stronghold. It's a bondage. And so that's why this book focuses on weakening the strongholds in your life. Addiction truly is hell on earth. You're enslaved, but you desperately want freedom. You're bound, but you can't break free. You're in tremendous pain, but you cannot find relief. If you can relate, don't worry, there is hope. If you feel you just can't quit, I believe that you can. There is hope for the hurting. And I love this little quote here. Believing a lie is always the first step in the wrong direction. Believing a lie is always the first step in the wrong direction. That's how the enemy often takes us down and here's the thing, I just can't quit. I'm going through it. And it, it, there are seasons when draws are pulling you. You've given into the addiction. Now it really has you. But I believe scripture talks about resisting the devil and he will flee, that no temptation uh, is too much for you. You can bear it as you give it to God and allow the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Spirit, help you uh, move forward. You know, as a person who has an addictive personality, sugar, caffeine, nicotine, I'm not nicotine necessarily, alcohol. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, it, I know the poll. Um, I have been addicted to many things. Oh, so there you go. I knew I, I saw that somewhere from coffee to sugar to alcohol, but alcohol was the most dangerous for me. And of course, many of you or opiate pain, re, you know, killers and oxy now. And now as this book is coming even more prevalent, more people downloading it, reading it, I'm hearing from more people how fentanyl is, um, is just, re, just dis- desecrating families and lives. And, so we've got to take a strong stance, you know, an extreme situation in our country is going to demand an extreme response. And that's what this book will focus on. And I learned this lesson the hard way. I remember um, when I first quit drinking, I stayed away from it for years. Uh, then I thought I could drink on special occasions because it didn't seem to be an issue for me anymore. But because of my past problem with alcohol as a young adult, the addiction was ready to take hold of me again. And it took a few embarrassing situations for me to finally realize that my supposed liberty was really waking a dormant addiction. So, and I've known people that if if struggled before and now they can have a beer now and then, um, and this book really isn't, you know, we don't get legalistic on this whole uh, topic. You know, I'm, I'm not the type that would say, you know, Christians can't have it ever because the Bible's clear that in moderation, uh, now and then, if you can have a beer once every couple of weeks, but we know 99% of you, that's not the case. And, uh, and people often ask me, you know, Shane, can you have a beer? I, I guess, can I, you know, but when you open that door, you're, you are walking down a dangerous path 
uh, that, that can give the enemy uh, some leverage there if you're not careful. So uh, some days the desire to drink was difficult. It would last for hours until I finally surrendered to the temptation. And the more I surrendered, the stronger the desire would become. Uh, complacently, complacency led to apathy and eventually it led to compromise. I would rationalize. Others are doing it. Why can't I? And this mindset, this mindset kept leading to failure. Believing a lie is always the first step in the wrong direction. I began to think if God really loved me, he wouldn't let me do this. Or I've had a hard day. I deserve to relax. Excuses kept me in a cycle of defeat, failure, and shame, especially for pastors because, you know, we, 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 a season of uh, relaxing is important. And often, you know, pastors will turn to certain things just to take the edge off. Uh, the problem is it might feel good for a few hours, but then, you know, there's hell to pay after that. Uh, it was one of the darkest periods of my life. I was quickly losing hope. God, please take this away was my weekly cry. And after finally hitting a low point, I began to seek God fervently and unconditionally. I asked a friend who had been through it before for help. His advice was simple yet life-changing. You say no and let God handle the rest. And the reason that is so profound is because we, as Christians, we, we have the ability to say no. Um, I'm going to get into this later. I don't believe it's a disease, I'm talking about alcohol now, um, or any addiction. Really, it's not a disease because a disease you know, kind of gives you the impression, hey, man, I got caught with this, this flu, this disease, this alcoholism. Man, it's not my fault. There's nothing I can do. No, as a believer, especially as a believer, you know, in, in, in scripture as our anchor, we can say no, but we, we trust on God to handle the rest. So we have a responsibility, but God needs to come alongside and help us as well. And that's why, you know, uh, these, some of these recovery programs focus on a higher power, which, you know, can be dangerous because that higher power better be Jesus Christ through repentance and faith and belief in him. And that's the only true higher power a person should be trusting. And I think I might get into that later. You can be sober, but not saved. And that's to me even more dangerous. Um, so let's get back on track here. Uh, I had to put an end to compromise saying, you know, I'll just have one because that began to trip me up sometimes. Um, and I was doing the same thing, but I was expecting different results. And that of course is the classic definition of insanity. But when I focused on humility and accountability and decided to fight the demonic influences rather than succumb to them, victory was no longer elusive. I conceded that only God could change me. Full surrender is not optional. In this battle, we must surrender to win. And even when we surrender and we're doing great, you know, if we begin to open that door again and have too much or compromise, you know, that stronghold can come back in and take us over again. And that verse people use, you know, um, that, that, that seven worse will come back um, if the house is not swept and kept in order. I, I don't think that applies to a believer. Um, I, don't, I, I don't, so I don't use that verse for a believer, but I have found, and many of you know that if you give back in, when it comes back, it often does come back much stronger and it is harder to break. So basically, once I did my part and God, God did his, by God's grace, he stopped the train before the wreck. Again, but for the grace of God, there go I, there go you. You know, we can fall back into it and be back on the, the train track again, heading in the wrong direction. So it's, it's a, many, for many people, it's a constant struggle. Uh, quitting was not easy and the desire to drink did not leave right away. It was a battle and anyone who has been there knows that. The first 30 days, for example, can be extremely difficult, but don't give up, look up. So let me give you an important re. Oh, you see, here you go. You're sober, but not saved. I knew it was there coming up soon. Uh, an important recap. Regardless of what your stronghold is, the points below are going to be critical to success. So let's revisit them briefly. Number one, you've got to remove excuses. I cannot stress this enough. How many, you know, I, I hear from men all the time. Well, my wife is difficult. My work is challenging. I get home and the kids and the house is a mess. Well, how's it doing fixing the problem, sir? It's, it doesn't fix the problem. So we have to remove excuses. Uh, we have to avoid the triggers. You know, what is triggering, uh, what's going to trigger you? Uh, you know, maybe certain streets you shouldn't drive down, certain people you should, shouldn't associate with, you know, at a certain time of day. Um, and I begin to correlate mine with, um, uh, because alcohol is a sugar. And I would realize, you know, when I'm craving it, if I would have a lemonade, a little bit of lemonade or a little piece of dark chocolate, it would take the craving away. So I realize, and then that's why I get into vitamins, vitamin B complex and, and D and E 
K, you know, keeping your body in a healthy state with vitamins and minerals can also help to offset that because sometimes it's just a nutritional deficiency. And you, as soon as you have that little bit of uh, fructose saying fruit, it really does take that desire away. And then number three, you have to own it. You have to repent. You don't blame your spouse. You don't blame your upbringing. You don't bring your heritage or your parents or your genetic disposition. You own it and you repent. And there is, a, there is something to alcoholism being, or even other kinds of addictions being genetic. However, if you look at the study of genetics, which is called epigenetics, and how ge- genes can be reprogrammed and re, re, uh, re, um, not restarted, but yeah, reprogrammed. And so although you might be genetically set in this position, uh, you know, your genes, you know, may, might load the gun, but it's lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So you can, taking your thoughts captive, making different choices, you can offset that and you can change that gene expression uh, very easily in your life. It just takes a little bit of time. Apologize and repair the damage. That is so important. You apologize to those you offended. You repair the damage. And see, all this is getting you back on track. It's getting your heart right. Uh, you need to crush pride before it crushes you. Crush pride before it crushes you. Number six, don't entertain compromise. You know how compromise works. I've even heard of people who stop drinking non-alcoholic beer because it has a half a percent. You have six of those. You have equal to a beer alcohol-wise. You know, that can keep that going. Uh, Some kombucha, you know, you can can fill it a little bit. And so, you know, avoiding compromising situations, avoiding compromising decisions, like I just mentioned, that will really help. Number seven, admit your dependence on God and fully surrender to Him. If you do these seven steps, man, you're, you're on the right track. It's going to be really hard to knock you off track because anytime somebody falls or doesn't um, succeed or continues in their addiction, at least, at least two or three of these uh, principles are not being followed. So why wait? The train wreck could be just around the bend. Guys, wake up. Um, we're dealing with a lot of stuff in our church right now, and um, a lot of situations uh, are, are because of alcohol. Sober, but not saved. Sober, but not saved. The most successful recovery groups are those built on biblical principles such as confession, repentance, and humility, admitting that we are powerless over addiction and realizing only God can restore us to sanity. We must decide to turn our lives completely over to Him, full surrender. And you can't just say, higher power, I found my inner self. It has to, you name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for me, and I've confessed my sin and I turn my life completely over to him. He's the only way, the only truth, the only way to the Father. We've got to get over this nonsense of higher power. And it might work for some people. You know, oh, I found this inner self and higher power. It's really helped me. Okay, but you're sober, but you're not saved. And um, to me, what's the point of being sober here for a brief second compared to eternity separated from God? So um, let, me get, let me get back on track here with this chapter. Um, we also must admit that our lifestyle is wrong and when possible, make amends with those we have injured, humility and repentance. I thank God for recovery groups, but unless a person turns to the one true and living God, they will be sober, but not saved. We can't just say God as I understand him or a higher power. We must confess him, Christ as Savior and Lord. He is our only hope. And this really hit home for me some time ago. I had the privilege of attending a recovery meeting while doing research for this book. The guest speaker, I believe it was actually an AA meeting, a friend invited me to, and I was uh, I actually went for quite a while and, and just talked to people, did some research for this book. Um, the guest speaker had over 20 years of sobriety, but she was suicidal, depressed, and confused. I thought, wow, and she made it clear. I mean, she was miserable speaking. I'm like, if this is a guest speaker... Boy, this lady needs ministry. Uh, every, uh, every childhood abuse had left her broken and shattered. Instead of offering listeners hope, her message was downright depressing. She was mad at God and made sure we all knew it. My heart truly broke for her. She was sober but not saved. This event motivated me to complete this book and help others find freedom and wholeness, not just sobriety. What does it profit us to gain the whole world or find sobriety yet lose our soul? Mark eight thirty six. We hear a great deal about God's judgment and what can keep us from heaven, and rightly so, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs 1.7. But we also need to reflect on God's goodness, love, mercy, and grace. So see, it's the judgment and the righteousness of God and the sin that draws me to him. But then it's his goodness, grace, and mercy 
um, and love that compels me to continue to walk the course upright. Jesus healed my brokenness and restored my life, and he can do the same for you. A deep longing is inside all of us that cannot be satisfied until we recognize our need for a Savior, repent of our sin, and turn to him. Once you do this, your past is forgiven, your present secure, and your future certain. Through Christ, you are a brand new person. If you truly grasp this truth, it can motivate and encourage you beyond measure. Though the road ahead may be uncertain at times, the solid ground beneath will never shift. It's all about who you know. And again, we will go into that more in the next chapter. Childhood trauma, stepping stone or stumbling block? And I've been told, you know, like many of you, that I have a form of post-traumatic stress disorder, which to me, it's just maybe a light form compared to what others have been through. Um, I, I, to me, I, I had a pretty good upbringing. Um, but because, you know, I had an angry father, you know, walking around on eggshells in the house. Many of you know what that feels like. And just anger was how we dealt with things. Anger was how he dealt with things. You know, it definitely plays a role in um, how a child, you know, feels as they grow up. And this allowed me to excuse my actions for many years. I love my father, who is now deceased, and appreciate his work ethic and uh, what he learned on the farms of Oklahoma. And he also uh, taught me that hard work e ethic, but he brought a lot of anger into the family. His addiction to caffeine and nicotine, along with being an unbeliever, was a big part of the problem. Our house was like a volcano waiting to erupt. When people use the phrase, walking on eggshells, I know exactly what they mean. To deal with this pain, I took my first drink at 12, uh, then began drinking consistently around the age of 16. Ironically, this is not in the book, where I took my first drink is about a half mile behind me, where I'm doing this podcast right now. Just a half mile right up the street, across from the Little League field. Never forget, my friend's parents had, a, had wine in the house, and we said, hey, let's try this stuff out. And my love for it uh, was set that day. I also use food. So that's another thing. I wouldn't have it in your homes, parents. I really wouldn't. I would err on the side because that's where uh, even at 16, 17, other friend's house, I remember his name was Kevin. My other friend's name was Mike. Don't want to say their last names. But uh, their parents had wild turkey, Jack Daniels, and a Southern Comfort, and we would uh, have it. At a young age, you know, that was just, man, I, I became alive and, and I can't, became fun to be around and I, it, it suppressed all my, um, you know, all my pain. It, it uh, eventually, though, led to a, a really uh, destructive life. And I also used food for comfort and I began to gain weight early on. I still remember the headline underneath my picture in our junior year yearbook, junior high yearbook. It said, Stuffed Pig. I was in a red wagon with an apple in my mouth being pulled around because I had just broken my leg. This was the triggering factor for my future steroid use and weightlifting. I shot up past 270 pounds. I think that picture is on Google. If you put my name, Shane Eidelman Pictures, it might come up. Uh, and I was bench pressing over 400 pounds all in my early 20s. My I'll show you mentality fueled this lifestyle of destruction. As a child, I tended to isolate myself to present, prevent future pain. I became an approval seeker, something you would find hard to believe if you heard my preaching today. Angry people scare me, and personal criticism hurts for this reason more deeply than it should. To my knowledge, my father never told me he loved me, but I know he did, and he died at an early age of 54, which I will be turning here next month. And uh, the enemy has been using that, you know, as far as, as instilling fear uh, dying at that same young age, but he didn't take care of his body. And he was, you know, God obviously called him home. He, he became, he knew the Lord uh, a couple, I think a couple years before his death. So praise God for that. My mom played a huge role in that. Uh, she just passed away. Uh, it's going to be on three years now as well. This book was dedicated to her. She helped me edit it. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. The deep pains of childhood can follow us and the enemy of our soul will use them against us. Thankfully, God makes provision for all of our needs through his Word. He must be our anchor and our true source of hope. However, those who are enslaved often do the reverse. They turn to the addictive substance rather, to, rather than to God. One of the greatest lessons I learned is this. We can either fully yield to God or we can yield to sin. The choice is ours. We are not robots on autopilot. We've been given this enormous responsibility of choice, and we must be accountable to our actions. We make a choice. I uh, like this one. Let's highlight it. We make a choice, then that choice makes us. I'm going to highlight extra here. Um, and just a, a reminder, 
if you're listening on the radio or maybe you're, you're, you're you know, fast forward and you're coming to this part, I'm also recording a video podcast that we're going to release in conjunction with the audio. The audio will probably be on Audible, uh, where you can listen on Audible, but then I'm going to put the uh, video casting where you can wa- actually watch me reading the book and commenting on certain sections. We're going to put that on my YouTube channel, the church YouTube channel, Westside Christian Fellowship, our Rumble channels. We'll release it on Facebook, Twitter, and hopefully Instagram as well. And so pl- pass this information on. Um, and I want to pause for a moment and use this opportunity to speak to the parent caught in addiction. And that's what I'm dealing with right now. We've got s- about a half dozen different issues at our church. The parent is caught in addiction and it's destroying their family. God loves you and wants you to turn from your destructive lifestyle. The choices you make today will dramatically impact your kids in the future as well as your physical and spiritual health. Sadly, many babies are born addicted to opiates and will experience painful withdrawals. The cycle of addiction must stop and it begins with you. I'm not talking to to just parents who are pregnant, moms who are pregnant or who just had newborns or young I'm talking to those where your kid is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You're, you're still, this addiction is going to really, um, really hurt them as they get older. But can you imagine you just owning it? Hey, I repent. I'm going to get help. That would go a long ways in restoring their confidence, not only in you, but in God. See, that's what import, is important. They look at us often like, well, they, they say they love God. They're Christian. But look, how is this happening? And so for them to see you repent and get back on track is, I can't even, I can't stress how important that is. The cycle of addiction must stop. And again, it begins with you. Don't let past pain continue to pull you down. Use it as a stepping stone. It's been said that shepherds from time to time would break the leg of a lamb that continually wandered from the flock and the shepherd's protection. Now, I haven't verified this, but I've, I've heard it a few different times. And I think it's interesting, the shepherd would then splint the broken leg and carry the lamb on his shoulders for weeks until the leg healed. As painful as this was for the lamb, it was necessary to protect the lamb from being ravished by wolves or other predators. In time, through the dependent relationship, the lamb learned to walk and remain in the protective presence of his shepherd. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this with Jesus, right? This concept was well stated by G- by David in Psalm 51, 8, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. And Isaiah reminds us, all we like sheep have gone astray. Ironically, many think, I'm sorry, ironically, many thank the Lord for using their addiction to bring them back to the good shepherd. The lesson is to run to him, not away from him. Often, the greater the brokenness, the greater the dependence on God. Those who have been forgiven much love much, Luke 7, 47. Again, use past pain as a stepping stone toward a closer relationship with God rather than a stumbling block that leads you back to addiction. That is profound, and I need to say that again. Use past pain as a stepping stone toward a closer relationship with God rather than a stumbling block that keeps you in that cycle of addiction. One of the greatest joys associated with pastoring is seeing others filled with the Spirit of God. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart, full surrender, giving God everything. And so my goal is to fan the flames of passion toward God. This book is not a step-by-step guide written from a medical perspective. It's a biblically-centered resource pointing you to the one who has the answers. As a pastor, I've seen the devastation that addiction brings, but I've also seen the victories. Just as water ever seeks and fills the lowest place, so the moment God finds you abased and empty at your lowest spot, his glory and power will flow in. I believe that was Gordon Cove who said that. Again, humble yourself, empty yourself, and let God fill you. And that is the way you get through addiction. Uh, For additional help, search for topical sermons at either westsidechristianfellowship.org or shaneidleman.com or, again, my YouTube or Rumble channel. Again, you can go and and find this video cast, this video podcast of me reading this book and send it to those who need help in the area. We'll be tackling Chapter 2, Changing from the Inside Out. So hope that helped. (laughs) 